thank you very much. And uh, Harold, congratulations on a great career and being in the Hall of Fame and inducted. Thank you. Two part question for you. Um, what team or uh, players were you most hyped up to get playing against that you knew that you literally were going to war? And the second part of the question is, as you've seen how football has evolved with the rule changes, if you were playing today, how many more catches do you think you would have? Or how, how much more difficult would it be playing in today's football? Oh, wow. Well, well, you know, uh, the hype team that uh, you wanted to play against is those teams that are going to be on television a lot. You know, we weren't on television a lot, but when we played uh, the Cowboys or you played um, – uh, I, I, I guess you would call the the Redskins. You know, a lot of people in my division get out of division. Mm -hmm. um, you knew you was going to be on national TV, so you uh, you wanted to show what you had uh, on, on those games. And you know, in Philadelphia, uh, the NFC um, East is very very hype. It's a hype conference, you know, you know, with the Cowboys, you know, and all of and that's the only one that's away from this area. We got the the Giants and the um, and Washington football team, the, you know, with those, just those two, and then bringing Dallas in from Dallas, most of our fans are really wanted, they wanted, they wanted you to get to get Dallas, you know, because that's bragging rights right there. You know, we have a bunch of Dallas fans up here and um, uh, I, I got some relatives that I don't really like them to come around my house that are Dallas Cowboy fans and all, but, you know, we have to put up with them sometimes. But, with the rule change, you know, a lot of people ask me about the rule changes and, the, you know, it kind of it runs me crazy because uh, if you look at the defensive the defensive uh, receiver, you can't touch them. You know, uh, to me, the way I was raised in football, intimidation was part of the game. And any kind of way you can intimidate uh, your opponent, that was a plus. If you can get into his head, and can slow him up, even though, you know, he might be faster, and he plays the, the, uh, that position very well. You get in his head so many different ways by, you know, trying to knock him down, you know, blocking him, running patterns on him, scoring touchdowns on him, uh, some kind of way just to get in the head. But, you know, you look at the rule changes, you know, I did play uh, pretty much uh, the early part of that, uh, well, uh, early part of that um, five-yard, uh, you can't touch the receiver. And I look at that, I say, man, I would beat up down, up, you know, uh, up and down the field. The ball would be 25 yards on the other uh, sideline, and they clotheslined me on this one. I, I was nowhere near the plate. But, you know, that, you know, you, you can't do that anymore. And, you know, I, you know I, and then again, people ask me, well, how many catches would have had? I say, I wonder if I'd have been drafted because everybody looking for those four two guys running the running batters now and I was nowhere near that but you know I again as I uh, stated earlier I had to make uh, good of my size and uh, put myself between the football and the defensive player and um, that's how I kind of you know got around to being you know with that speed you know and uh, trying to catch anything that came up close to me within three yards of me you know with these long arms and stuff and it cut you know it cut me down it went with the uh Four, four, six speed. It probably cut me down to about five, four, five. You know, something like that because of reach and my height. Bob, do you well, how you doing? Good, Paul. How are you? Good, thank you. Hey, uh, when I talked to you last summer, uh, after the ceremony was initially canceled, you had said that you know you'd waited thirty-one years. One more year wasn't going to matter. Um, has that turned out to be the case? Are you as excited as ever for? Uh, for August to, to come? Well, Paul, there was nothing else for me to do but wait. I, you know, I couldn't do it on my own. So I had to wait and just, you know, it's been a, a very trying uh, time, you know, waiting, you know, again, like, I waited for over 30, 35 years and all that. Um, one more year didn't hurt. It just, um, it, it got, it became like saying, gosh, I can't, you know, and then the pandemic hit. That was the big part about it. You know, um, you couldn't really enjoy it. Um, with the fans and people, you know, that uh, uh, supported you through, um, supported me through the years. And it was very tough to just to go through that. Um, next question, we'll go to Joe Rudder. Joe, I think you, there you go. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, you know, being you're in the centennial class with a guy like Donnie Shell, 
two guys from historically black colleges. What does that mean for you to go in together? And do you have much of a relationship with Donnie? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Donnie and I were, well, you know, pretty good friends after really uh, beating up on each other, playing, you know, doing this, um, doing our careers. And I'll, I always told, told him Colin was a cheap shot, you know, but uh, he used to be tough for me, pretty good. But it was very, it's very exciting going in with Donnie. I, I, when we first got together up in New York, I, I have pictures of it where we're giving each other a big hug. But, um, you know, we went also went through it uh, with the Black College Football Hall of Fame. It's been exciting to be with Donnie and in the both um, uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame and also the Black College Football Hall of Fame. He's a great guy, a great competitor. And uh, right now we're we're, uh, we're pretty good friends, real good friends. We'll go to Dave for the next question. Hey, Harold. Uh, we saw that scene at the Novacare Complex when you, you got back and, and a whole bunch of people were waiting uh, to celebrate you. What was that moment like and, and what has the last year been like as, as you've gotten all these congratulations? Oh, that was so awesome. I thought I was just going over to have an uh, interview of uh, one of the uh, media guys. And um, I, when I got out of my truck, they had me pulled right in the front where I don't normally uh, park. And um, standing in the door was the president, uh, Don Strolinski, and Howie Roseman. Um, I said, something is going on. And then when they, I walked into the building and the whole organization was there in the lobby, that was so thrilling and so humbling to me. It was tough to really uh, deal with, you know, because um, it's tough to hold back tears and all, which I did a pretty good job, but not a very good job but very humbling to see people there that uh i've worked with and uh been around for years and a very exciting a moment for me Raphael, you can have the next question hello mr carl michael this is Raphael haynes with the three-point conversion how are you i'm well i uh, hope you're well and congrats well, thank you, thank you. Honored, honored to talk to you and wanted to ask you but you've been six eight. Do you feel like you were the start of having a tall receiver? Like it seemed like after you, next thing you know, you saw a lot of receivers come in six three, six four, even six five. Do you feel like you were you were the person that pushed that or made that prevalent? Well, I don't think I was really in that first group. You know, uh, one of my uh, coaches and and uh, one of the coaches that taught me a lot that kind of built me uh, to, uh, to play the uh, wide receiver position with Boyd Dollar. Boyd played for the Green Bay Packers, and Boyd was like 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and um, uh, I think I kind of they, – they brought me in and grew me, you know, almost like after Boyd Dollar. And, you know, uh, they, they in fact, they had um, some other guys that played tight end. But, uh, again, it's the difference. You know, they had to, they tried me in tight end, but they put me outside – well, I was happy that they did because they were kicking butt, you know, kicking my butt in this out of that offensive line. But, um, you know, it was um, something that I had to develop. It was nothing that, you know, some guys can just walk on a field and walk on a football field and and just it happened. So I had to work at it because trying to get my, my mind and my legs to work together, it took a while, you know, these long legs of mine. And, you know, I know some coaches, they remember to say, well, Give him a couple of weeks when he get his head and his legs together, he'll be fine. Because I used to fall on my face so much, you know, trying to run patterns. And and one of the things Boyd Dollar taught me when he was coaching with the Eagles is that I can't run patterns like a five eight, uh, uh, six foot guy. You know, he he fixed me, and uh, which I was trying to do. So he said, "No, Harold, you have to do it this way." And they kind of built the office around me being able to run patterns with my long strides. Jake, you can go ahead with the next question. Hello, uh, Mr. Carmichael. First and foremost, congratulations. I know you've been Thank waiting you. a long time, so congratulations on uh, being in the Hall of, or being accepted into the Hall of Fame now. Uh, thank you. So obviously you're still a big Eagle supporter. I can see it on your shirt. Uh, I, I know that is you played your career with, with the exception of one season, which you really didn't even play with Dallas. You were an Eagles player through and through. 
Eagles finally won their first championship in 2018. Just how elated and excited must you have been? Like just how was that? Finally, you play, you play your whole career in Philly, right? You give them probably everything you've ever gotten, right? And they finally can win a championship. And you're probably just like the rest of us, you know, the fans, right? Ecstatic. What was that like? Well, exactly. That's the word, Jake. Is very ecstatic about it. We went to the Super Bowl in 1980. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't win the game. But uh, being able to be there and watch the Eagles uh, win the Super Bowl is very exciting for me. Very exciting for the whole Philadelphia uh, fan base. Uh, you know, something that they have been waiting on, waiting for for years. And, uh, you know, uh, we won championship games back in, in the 60s and all, you know. But, uh, you know, people wanted to hear uh, Super Bowl winners and stuff. So um, it, everybody don't really realize that, that the Eagles uh, won some championship games before but they didn't call it the whole, I mean, they didn't call it the Super Bowl. But yes, I mean, I was there. Uh, I was there for the uh, NFC Championship. We went out uh, out to um, Minnesota, uh, where it was so cold that day. But, you know, we could, we, we would take it, you know, just to be there and to uh, win it. It was very exciting for the whole Philadelphia fan base. Steve Ramsey. Um, Steve Ramsey with the high school, uh, with the HBCU Sports Review. Congratulations, Mr. Carmichael, and uh, you, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, you. I, I have a two-fold question. In 1971, you were one of 55 players drafted from a HBCU. Describe the feeling uh, you must have felt back in 1971 as an HBCU player being drafted to uh, – as one of the few being drafted to uh, the NFL and being one of the few to be placed in the Hall of Fame. And my second part to that question is, how do you, what's your thoughts about no HBCU players being drafted in this past uh, 2021 draft? Well, I was going to, you know, I can put it all together because you were saying 55 the year I uh, was drafted in. And I'm just looking at none this year because you know, it, it's very, very um, troublesome to me to, to see that happen because back in the um, the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of the big time ball players were coming out of HBC uh, college um, teams and all. And um, it was very gratifying for me to be drafted. You know, I had an agent that um, was around with me for about a, about a year and a half and was telling me that I was going to get drafted between like the second, third, or fourth round. So I'm sitting there waiting for that to happen, you know, and it, it never happened. You know, I had to wait till the seventh round to get it, you know. But, you know, I was just very blessed to, to get to get, to get drafted. And just to, um, I, I just wanted to get in there and just open the door for me just to be able to show what I could do. And, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of things that was going through my head at the time. I'm saying maybe I wasn't good enough, to be, you know, to get drafted and all. But, you know, uh, again, was blessed enough with the skills, um, especially the hands. You know, I, you know, I, I don't want to try to brag because, you know, I, I can talk about my hands and talk about my legs because I was too slow. You know, but uh, I didn't think I didn't think anybody could out catch me. But, you know, um, I just wondered if, if that speed out. I, I ran a four six. And I was just wondering, wondering if that would work because a lot of the guys, wide receivers that was coming out at the time, they were running uh, something like uh, four threes, four fours, some even four fives and all, and uh, running rings around me. But I said, well, I had to find a way to um, to really uh, make good of my height and all the just doing that basketball thing, putting my body between the ball and the defender. But uh, yes, it was, uh, you know, I, I was really, Sad to hear uh, the past few, you know, I heard about the past couple of weeks about no uh, HBCU players was drafted uh, in this year's draft. And there's a lot of times when a lot of the guys from HBCU teams get, they, uh, fall through the cracks. You know, there's a lot of good football players there, but I don't think some of, you know, some of the NFL teams really respect that, you know, um, they try to, you know, they, they send guys there, but they get the guys a wink at it and they go home, you know, uh, not really putting in a lot of um, focus on the players. Again, there's a lot, you know, I watched a, lot, a couple of the um, 
uh, HBCU uh, games of uh, the uh, past season. And you, you can see some good ball players there, but people just, you know, they want to go to the big schools and all. And, and um, if they give those guys, I guarantee you those guys that the free agents uh, that um, was picked up uh, with some of these teams, I guarantee you some of those are making it for some of the draft choices as well. Well, thank you for representing HBCU, sir. Thank you and okay. congratulations. Thank you. Mark Holmes, you can ask the next question. Ask Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, you're up next. Yeah, hey, Harold. Hello, Bob. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, it's getting close. It's getting close, Harold. Oh, that, that's the Bob right there. Hi, Bob. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> okay. Hey, Harold, um, that, that streak with um, of 127 games, with at least one reception, how, how much of that play in your mind? And, and you remember Billy Wardell, the guy who kind of oh, yeah, yeah. track of it, right? How, right. How, did that kind of help put you on the map a little bit? And I know you're not a big stats guy, but uh, that was 127 consecutive games with a catch uh, when the rules were different and intimidation was part of the game. How were Mar I mean, how do you look at that? And, and did you pay attention to it? And, and did that put it on put you on the map? Well, I had no clue. You know that, Bob, until Warren Dale brought it up. You know, he, when I got to probably about, you know, like, uh, uh, I guess, 85, 90, something like that. Um, he, I, I say around 90, he would call every game, say, you know, you got a catch, you got 90, you got 92. He doing that every, every week pretty much. And, you know, it was something that, again, being very blessed, you know, because the start of my career, you know, I dislocated my thumb my rookie year. I tore my knee up my rookie year, and uh, that's the reason why the streak wasn't going longer, you know. But then again, there was a there was a um, time in there, uh, my second year, where I could have made about a, a couple of thousand more dollars on incentives. But uh, that's when it was um, really you going by how many minutes you play in a game. So I needed two minutes to play in a game, and I didn't play at all that game pretty much and didn't get that incentive. But that would have been part of that um, a streak also. But it was very exciting uh, to get the trophy. But one of the things I'm going to ask the Hall of Fame is the trophy that they gave me when I broke that record, where is it now? You know, they had put it in the Hall of Fame. It was 22 feet tall. And uh, I was, I've was i been there a couple of times and it's not there anymore. And I just wondered if they used that for some firewood or what. <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I want to find out where that trophy is. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, that it was a it was an exciting time, you know. Um, uh, but you know, only family, a lot of family members. But my, you know, I got pictures of my son. Um, you can see the trophy in the background. He was like, uh, he was only one one years old and stuff when I got that. So, but you know, um, very exciting moment. Um, you know, um, uh, it's not too many guys that they'll stop a game for. You know, when they stopped the game for Drew Brees, I said, you're not the only one they stopped the game for and presented an uh, award to. I, I did it too back in 1980. But it was very exciting uh, for me to get that. Uh, just like now, to be inducted, to get that gold jacket, to get that bus, and to get that ring is, is very exciting for me. Chris Daly. See you in a couple of weeks. Hey, Harold. Firstly, congratulations. And after walking on to Southern University, you became a star receiver. And one of your teammates at the time was an all-time great NFL defensive back, Mel Blunt. So what were those practices like with Mel pushing you to the limits? And what did you learn from that time with him? Oh, wow. You know, uh, I always make a joke about it, which Mel was uh, um, one of the greatest guys in college for me and uh, still is right now. But um, I went to school with Mel Blunt's first cousin. Uh, her name was Brenda Blunt, and from first grade all the way to twelfth grade, I loved that. I loved her, <laughs> you know. And I, um, I, but she didn't want to have anything to do with me. So when I got to Southern, and Mel, you know, going against Mel every day, and with um, with the other defensive, I mean, other uh, wide receivers, when they would catch a pass on Blunt, um, Mel, he was just like two hand touched him. Uh, but when I caught a pass on him, he would clothesline me, forearm me. And then one day I just said, 
did Brenda ever say anything to me about uh, uh, to you about me? Because you're really so tough on me. Why don't you talk on these other guys? He just laughed and was joking about it. But I, I, one of the greatest guys I ever played college ball with, one of the greatest guys I went against in the National Football League, uh, a guy that I say prepared me for the NFL. Uh, he took me on his swing on a little bit. Uh, sometimes when we were on campus and uh, we didn't have enough money or the or the um, the places where you go get a sandwich for clothes and Mel would say, come, come over to the house, you know, come get you something to eat. And uh, he took care of us like that. But, you know, a great guy. I mean, if you ever talk to him and see what the work that he's doing in Pittsburgh now, he's still an unbelievable person. A lot of respect for him. Thanks, Chris. Alex? Alex Lynn? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Carmichael, congratulations, and I'll be seeing you soon in a couple of weeks. Um, Thank two you. Questions. Alex? Yes, I think we're having trouble with your reception. We're going to go to somebody else, and we'll come back to you. Paul Gant? Harold, congratulations on making the Hall of Fame, sir. Thank you. I, I want to ask you this. You, you look at, you, you talked about earlier some of the teams that you kind of hated on some level. And we look at the Dallas Cowboys, 1980 NFC Championship game. Was that one of the greatest moments for you as a player? You got finally broke through, finally got to the Super Bowl? It was a great moment for me, you know, and for the host uh, city of Philadelphia. Um, very, very cold day. You know, um, I think that kind of helped us out a lot because uh, I didn't think they, you know, they practiced in, in inside and all that. And we practiced the whole two weeks pretty much in the cold weather. But it was a very exciting time for us um, um, watching Wilbert um, make that big run. Um, and everybody talks about that, but they never talk about the block that I made. For him, you know, and uh, but no, I, I kind of almost missed my man completely, you know. But, um, no, it was very exciting times again for Philadelphia base, uh, fan base, and uh, the team because then we know that we had with, with Dick Vermeil what he had done in the, in the past four or five years, uh, really came came into being and uh, what we had worked for for, ye uh, for years and uh, the, um, the amount of work and the hard work we put in. The hard work that uh, Dick for Bill uh, uh, put against us was very, very tough and very exciting to be, be in that situation to beat Dallas for the NFC Championship. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, you want to try again? Love to try again. <laughs> Mr. Carmichael, congratulations on becoming a Hall of Famer and hopefully I can see you soon in the next couple of weeks. Oh, thank you. Two-part question. One, how did perseverance play a role considering that things were a lot in the 70s and 80s than it is now currently in the NFL? And number two, have you ever stopped and thought about how your accolades led to the Chris Carters, the Randy Mosses, and of course the Calvin Johnsons? Because after speaking with Isaac Bruce, he said that you were one of the wide receivers that he watched and grew up with. So have you ever thought about how you set the standard of wide receiver play? No, not really. Uh, uh, the only time you think about it was somebody would ask a question like you, you're asking um, about that and never thought about it. Um, but, you know, just trying to play my game. You know, you, you look at guys, again, a lot of guys back in the uh, um, late 70s, pretty much, and, you know, early 80s, uh, you look at the guys uh, – the Smurf at uh, with the Washington football team. You look at Nat Moore um, in uh, in uh, Miami. You know these guys that are um, not tall wide receivers, but they're very good receivers. You know, and you kind of wondered, oh gosh, why? You know, you know, there's not that many big guys in it. You know, playing wide receiver like I'm playing, but you know, just something that I know that I had to do. Again, I had a lot of stuff that went against me because again. Wasn't, I wasn't fast, um, uh, again, but I, I knew I had good hands if I could just get it open just enough just to be able to catch the ball. But uh, I, I just know that I had to had to be better, seemed like to me, had to be better, twice as better 
as their guy that had to um, uh, that, that had to speed. One thing I you know I learned when I played uh, when I was uh, starting, and I kind of learned it from, uh, when I was with uh, the first quarterback Pete List, and then with uh, Roman Gabriel's and John Reed. I said, and I found this out in practice. I said, well, if I catch every ball that they throw to me in practice, they're not going to throw the ball to anybody else. They're going to be because everybody's trying to make the team, the quarterbacks also, so they know that I was going to catch the ball if they put it anywhere close to me. So I knew, uh, and I tell guys that, I said, you catch all the balls that the quarterbacks throw to you, he's going to look for you all the time. I really found that out in college too. You know, guys gonna throw that ball to the guys gonna catch. I don't catch how you catch it. You catch it in the hand, catch it in the body. But they know because they're not gonna put it on paper. He caught. Uh, he caught the ball in his hand. He caught it in his chest. You know, quarterbacks gonna look at that guy. And I and I found that out. They gonna look at that. Look for that guy that's gonna catch the ball for him all the time. And I just had. I had to do this. I had. I had to try to be as best as I could be because of my height and not, and, and slow. Did Dick Vermeil know that you were a special talent, or did he just, you know, pepper you with shots? Well, I'm quite sure he, he and knowing Dick Vermeil, he watched some of the practice film, game films in the past, and he knew uh, what I had. And um, I was one of the 12 uh, players that he kept around uh, because from 71 to about 70, 1975, we really weren't winning a lot of games and um, really didn't have a real good football team. And I, he, he watched those 12 guys, and he kept those 12 guys around. We call it the, uh, the core 12, kept us around, and uh, he built the team you know, from us, you know, around us, and which was some uh, great some uh, great guys that, I, that was in that 12 and all, and I really respected them and the way they played, and we played as, as, as a team. They were true teammates at that time. I mean, very, you know, there's going to be a bunch of guys. When I talk about these types of things, I think about the guys that's going to be at the Hall of Fame induction, guys that I remember um, that really went through Dick Vermeil's training camps. I don't, I'm quite sure you guys have heard about this Dick, his training camp. They were crazy. And um, I thought Dick Vermeil was crazy at one time because of the way he worked us. But, you know, we, we learned from that and we built from that and, uh, went went to the Super Bowl for that. Thank you, Harold. Um, that's going to conclude our media availability today with Harold. Harold, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with everyone. This session will be loaded onto the media site later today or first thing tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, great questions. Uh, you guys stay safe. Talk with you later.